A walk up the avenue. He came down the steps slowly and pulling mechanically at his gloves. He remembered afterwards that some woman's face had nodded brightly to him from a passing brougham, and that he had lifted his hat through force of habit, and without knowing who she was. He stopped at the bottom of the steps, and stood for a moment uncertainly, and then turned toward the north, not because he had any definite goal in his mind, but because the other way led toward his rooms and he did not want to go there yet. He was conscious of a strange feeling of elation, which he attributed to his being free, and to the fact that he was his own master again in everything. And with this he confessed to a distinct feeling of littleness, of having acted meanly or unworthily of himself or of her. And yet he had behaved well, even quixotically, he had tried to leave the impression with her that it was her wish, and that she had broken with him, not he with her. He held a man who threw a girl over as something contemptible, and he certainly did not want to appear to himself in that light, or, for her sake, that people should think he had tired of her, or found her wanting in any one particular. He knew only too well how people would talk, how they would say he had never really cared for her, that he didn't know his own mind when he had proposed to her, and that it was a great deal better for her as it is than if he had grown out of humor with her later. As to their saying she had jilted him, he didn't mind that. He much preferred they should take that view of it, and he was chivalrous enough to hope she would think so too. He was walking slowly and had reached 30th Street, a great many young girls and women had bowed to him, or nodded from the passing carriages, but it did not tend to disturb the measure of his thoughts. He was used to having people put themselves out to speak to him. Everybody made a point of knowing him, not because he was so very handsome and well-looking, and an over-popular youth, but because he was as yet unspoiled by it. But, in any event, he concluded it was a miserable business— Still, he had only done what was right. He had seen it coming on for a month now, and how much better it was that they should separate now than later, or that they should have had to live separated in all but location for the rest of their lives. Yes, he had done the right thing, decidedly the only thing to do. He was still walking up the avenue, and had reached 32nd Street, at which point his thoughts received a sudden turn. A half-dozen men in a club window nodded to him, and brought to him sharply what he was going back to. He had dropped out of their lives as entirely of late as though he had been living in a distant city. When he had met them, he had found their company uninteresting and unprofitable. He had wondered how he had ever cared for that sort of thing, and where had been the pleasure of it. Was he going back now to the gossip of that window, to the heavy discussions of traps and horses, to late breakfasts and early suppers? Must he listen to their congratulations on his being one of them again? And must he guess at their whispered conjectures as to how soon it would be before he again took up the chains and harness of their fashion? He struck the pavement sharply with his stick. No, he was not going back. She had taught him to find amusement and occupation in many things that were better and higher than any pleasures or pursuits he had known before, and he could not give them up. He had her to thank for that at least, and he would give her credit for it too, and gratefully. He would always remember it, and he would show in his way of living the influence and the good effects of these three months in which they had been continually together." He had reached 42nd Street now. Well, it was over with, and he would get to work at something or other. This experience had shown him that he was not meant for marriage, that he was intended to live alone. Because, if he found that a girl as lovely as she undeniably was palled on him after three months, it was evident that he would never live through life with any other one. Yes, he would always be a bachelor. He had lived his life, had told his story at the age of twenty-five, and would wait patiently for the end, a marked and gloomy man. 
He would travel now and see the world. He would go to that hotel in Cairo she was always talking about, where they were to have gone on their honeymoon, or he might strike further into Africa, and come back bronzed and worn with long marches and jungle fever, and with his hair prematurely white. He even considered himself with great self-pity, returning and finding her married and happy, of course. And he enjoyed, in anticipation, the secret doubts she would have of her later choice when she heard on all sides praise of this distinguished traveller. And he pictured himself meeting her reproachful glances with fatherly friendliness and presenting her husband with tiger skins and buying her children extravagant presents. This was at 45th Street. Yes, that was decidedly the best thing to do, to go away and improve himself and study up all those painters and cathedrals with which she was so hopelessly conversant. He remembered how out of it she had once made him feel, and how secretly he had admired her when she had referred to a modern painting as looking like those in the long gallery of the Louvre. He thought he knew all about the Louvre, but he would go over again and locate that long gallery and become able to talk to her understandingly about it. And then it came over him like a blast of icy air that he could never talk over things with her again. He had reached 55th Street now, and the shock brought him to a standstill on the corner where he stood gazing blankly before him. He felt rather weak physically and decided to go back to his rooms and then he pictured how cheerless they would look, and how little of comfort they contained. He had used them only to dress and sleep in of late, and the distaste with which he regarded the idea that he must go back to them to read and sit and live in them showed him how utterly his life had become bound up with the house on 27th Street. Where was he to go in the evening, he asked himself, with pathetic hopelessness, or in the morning or afternoon, for that matter, were there to be no more of those journeys to picture galleries and to the big publishing houses where they used to hover over the new book counter and pull the books about and make each other innumerable presents of daintily bound volumes until the clerks grew to know them so well that they never went through the form of asking where the books were to be sent and those tete-a-tete -tete luncheons at her house when her mother was upstairs with a headache or a dressmaker, and the long rides and walks in the park in the afternoon, and the rush downtown to dress, only to return to dine with them ten minutes late always, and always with some new excuse which was allowed if it was clever, and frowned at if it was commonplace. Was all this really over? Why, the town had only run on because she was in it, and as he walked the streets, the very shop windows had suggested her to him. Floris only existed that he might send her flowers, and gowns and bonnets in the milliner's windows were only pretty as they would become her, and as for the theatres and the newspapers, they were only worth while as they gave her pleasure, and he had given all this up, and for what? he asked himself, and why? He could not answer that now. It was simply because he had been surfeited with too much content, he replied passionately. He had not appreciated how happy he had been. She had been too kind, too gracious. He had never known until he had quarreled with her and lost her how precious and dear she had been to him. He was at the entrance to the park now, and he strode on along the walk, bitterly upbraiding himself for being worse than a criminal a fool a common blind mortal to whom a goddess had stooped he remembered with bitter regret a turn off the drive into which they had wandered one day a secluded pretty spot with a circle of box around it and into the turf of which he had driven his stick and claimed it for them both by the right of discovery and he recalled how they had used to go there, just out of sight of their friends in the ride, and sit and chatter on a green bench beneath a bush of box, like any nursery maid and her young man, while her groom stood at the brougham door in the bridal path beyond. He had broken off a sprig of the box one day and given it to her, and she had kissed it foolishly and laughed, 
and hidden it in the folds of her riding skirt, in burlesque fear lest the guards should arrest them for breaking the much-advertised ordinance. And he remembered with a miserable smile how she had delighted him with her account of her adventure to her mother, and described them as fleeing down the avenue with their treasure, pursued by a squadron of mounted policemen. This and a hundred other of the foolish, happy fancies they had shared in common came back to him, and he remembered how she had stopped one cold afternoon just outside of this favorite spot, beside an open iron grating sunk in the path, into which the rain had washed the autumn leaves and pretended it was a steam radiator, and held her slim gloved hands out over it as if to warm them. How absurdly happy she used to make him, and how light-hearted she had been! He determined suddenly and sentimentally to go to that secret place now, and bury the engagement ring she had handed back to him under that bush, as he had buried his hopes of happiness, and he pictured how some day when he was dead she would read of this in his will, and go and dig up the ring, and remember and forgive him. He struck off from the walk across the turf, straight toward the stell, taking the ring from his waistcoat pocket and clinching it in his hand. He was walking quickly with rapt interest in this idea of abnegation, when he noticed, unconsciously at first and then with a start, the familiar outlines and colors of her brougham, drawn up in the drive not twenty yards from their old meeting-place. He could not be mistaken. He knew the horses well enough, and there was old Wallace on the box, and young Wallace on the path. He stopped breathlessly, and then tipped on cautiously, keeping the encircling line of bushes between him and the carriage. And then he saw through the leaves that there was someone in the place, and that it was she. He stopped, confused and amazed. He could not comprehend it. She must have driven to the place immediately on his departure. But why? And why to that place of all others? He parted the bushes with his hands, and saw her lovely and sweet-looking, as she had always been, standing under the box-bush beside the bench, and breaking off one of the green branches. The branch parted, and the stem flew back to its place again, leaving a green sprig in her hand. She turned at that moment directly toward him, and he could see from his hiding-place how she lifted the leaves to her lips, and that a tear was creeping down her cheek. Then he dashed the bushes aside with both arms, and with a cry that no one but she heard, sprang toward her. Young Van Bibber stopped his male phaeton in front of the club, and went inside to recuperate, and told how he had seen them driving home through the park, in her brougham, and unchaperoned. "'Which I call very bad form,' said the punctilious Van Bibber, "'even though they are engaged.' End of section 4